Black Lodge Publishing welcomes you to a series of short talks on all things esoteric and occult. This talk follows on directly from part one, where I introduced the, the listener to the magical world of atavisms. In this and the final talks, I want to present to the practitioner a few more clues as to what atavisms are, but more importantly, how they can be magically activated. So, for example, when we enter that non-linear dream time by engaging the night side and where we induce those somewhat naughty succubi and incubi, what we are in fact doing is purposefully, or perhaps for those more accidentally caught up in self-gratification, is evoking various night side projections such as those entities depicted throughout history. These include strange winged entities, daimonii, Ophidian and other even stranger zoomorphic creatures. These can in fact be regarded as deep-rooted atavisms, more so if they are legitimately willed by the dreamer who accesses them from the very depths of their subconscious. For the practitioner, it can then become a question of how one can manipulate and engage the magical current. One should therefore be under no illusion that these atavisms will definitely appear, especially in your dreams. For this reason, Kenneth Grant's writings activate in the reader a keen sense of self-awareness, especially in the way his characters come to terms with the very core of their own true atavistic natures, especially when they discover their own instinctiveness. Thus, and for the reader, Rather than simply dismissing these anthropomorphic, theriomorphic and zoomorphic forms, human-animal entities, as irrational, one can alternately begin to accept the fact that these characteristics, and indeed that of our own mirroring nervous system, does in fact imitate and begin to recognise those states within living or even fictional entities, and accept they are even remotely like ourselves. Hence, Although we can easily take on behaviours and emotions anthropopathically, or oh, you're behaving like a dog, you snake in the grass, you have the mothering, mothering instinct of Tauret, you grunt like Sobek, you pray like a vulture, you lot are howling at the full moon like a troop of Kynokephaloi, all are nonetheless linked to magical features of ancient Egyptian blood rites. But that's another story. We should perhaps not forget that we still use our lizard serpent brain when necessary. True, but we don't use it that well. Why? Well, because we have been conditioned to cut them out from our awareness. For example, a lizard's needs are rather different than our own. Yet, alongside the process of adaption, there is another process involved in that of co-optation, which is basically a repurposing of adaptions that had originally served a different need such as feathers on birds. So how can we purposefully reactivate our ophidian, serpent, lizard or lycanthropic brains or indeed whatever we choose and then nurture them in such a way as to, when and wherever we might want to use them, that is to state it clearly, evoke them magically. And would you want to? You're probably thinking what purpose could they serve? What would it help in my evolution? perhaps even strengthen my own weaknesses, or perhaps, as Crowley and especially Grant throughout his novellas suggest, expand our awareness of reality, or perhaps even help us obtain a fuller or heightened utilisation of our physical aesthetai, or senses. And could this provide us with better understanding of the world in general? Could activating atavisms therefore help improve the quality of, say, our observation or our olfactory sense or indeed our perceptual sense in general. Could atavistic resurgence allow a conscious participation in the world on a symbiogenic level as in that of plant resurgence as it is keenly inspired and described in the works of Spare and Grant? After all, our world itself behaves such as a single but very complex organism attached through the central axis, anima mundi, as a scintillating fire, or indeed philosophical mercury. Hearing, for example, has been repurposed to detect such as an oncoming train instead of something coming to eat us. Yet, 
both still tap into that instinctive fear of noise? Or could sensitivity to electromagnetic waves help us find free Wi-Fi or keep us warm? Insects certainly demonstrate a sensitivity to our electronics and light waves, and where they are attracted to electric fields and vibration, demonstrated in Sherlock's violin playing, where order is established out of chaos or better, that described by the Egyptian Mahat versus Isfet. Is the virtual world such as Second Life a form of atavism? Well, it can be. Many people in Second Life do favour their anthropomorphic or theriomorphic avatars, e.g. mermaids, fairies, unicorns, angels or better golems. It has been established by science that the brain cannot tell the difference between real experience and vividly imagined experience, and thus in magic our rituals primarily serve the purpose of fully engrossing the practitioner in the content of their imagination, and more so in the use of desire, intention, will, through their own creative esotericism. Yet, and as Grant notes, this methodology can cause severe problems. For example, Vilma Z in Gamaliel, The Diary of a Vampire, where imagination takes over the will, we are told in the intro that efforts to achieve a state of divinity, rare and difficult as they may be, can result in abysmal regression to atavisms predating human consciousness. Therefore, when Vilma's diary opens, she is already on that downward path, and as anyone who has undertaken experiments in spiritual alchemy will attest, that is, unless they are initiated, then guided as such, a conflict between the will and the imagination, where imagination overwhelms the will and returns the experimenter to a pre-evil past in which our vampire, Vilma Z, is unable to properly deal with. This leads us to ask the question, are rituals atavistic? For they do rely on triggering and mirroring the nervous system in one way or another. Though such, ritual, ceremonial dance and music, meditation, mantras and even down to costumes. Sometimes the purpose is to create a link with and even a sort of identification with other species that cover the original body. For this reason, atavistic resurgence of this type is therefore one of the oldest forms of ritual on the entire planet. Remember that rituals help activate part of our brains that partially reactivate the more primitive parts of our genetic makeup, but not only cognitively, but also through somatic awareness. For example, Grant mentions tantrism and the raising of the fire serpent, chakra activation and relaxation, posture awareness, which can then allow for the loosening of our solar consciousness and lunar subconscious. And it is through these that can allow for the magical praxis and transitioning between both. I prefer Grant's use of the term dislimming. Therefore, we all draw from the same pool of physical and metaphysical potential. For example, Grant's comments on Austin Osman's Spare in Nightside of Eden, pages 10 to 11, and where he notes that Spare realised that in order to become God, man must regress to the primal or original state of consciousness. This is the ultimate rationale behind the attempts by occultists of all ages to leap backward and inward to the interior depths of the tree, thereby reverting to the pre-evil state of consciousness before Kether transmitted the current of manifestation from the I and the void in. The argument that has so far been advanced is that it is entirely possible through magic, meditation and or ritual sympathia to activate those deep subconscious atavisms. Algernon, Blackwood, Mackin, Lovecraft, Crowley, Spare and the Grants certainly thought so. Many thanks. Join me for part three of this short lecture series and please subscribe to Black Lodge Publishing for future events and publications.